My name is Howie Newman. Let me explain what you signed. Explain to you what you signed up for here. It's a musical baseball show, so I'm going to be doing some uh, baseball songs, uh, most of which I've written, but there will be a few songs that you uh, know, and uh, doing some trivia, telling some stories, and as Brandon explained, we're trying to make this as interactive as possible. So feel free to join in if you if you have a question or a comment or a, a good recipe or whatever, you know, just feel free to interrupt. Not, preferably not in the middle of a song, because that can be a little bit uh, distracting. But uh, we, we have, we've had uh, good success with this. We've had a lot of fun with it. And uh, so I hope, uh, I, I assume we will have this, the same this morning. And also, uh, we're going to have a free raffle for one of my baseball albums. I'll explain how that works a little bit later on. but. Uh, Anyway, so that's also another way we, we need to be interactive. Anyway, before I get started here, I want to just uh, kind of get a pulse of the audience. Uh, how many of you guys are like diehard baseball fans? All right, one, okay. So I expect you're going to do well on the trivia questions. And how many of you are just kind of casual fans? Okay, and ha how many of you, uh, you're just sick of Netflix. You want to try something different. It's free. You figure, what the heck, you know, all right, good. <laughs> Anyway, let me explain a little bit uh, about my background. Um, I was a sports writer for 18 years. Uh, I covered the Red Sox quite a bit. I worked for the Patriot Ledger, the uh, Lowell Sun, the Boston Globe, the uh, Lynn Daly Item, uh, Associated Press, baseball magazines, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I covered the World Series in 1985 and 1986. And in 1985, uh, did not have a laptop. You know, I, I, and I don't think anybody had laptops. They were portable computers, but there were no laptops. They were these big, bulky things. So in order to file the story, I had to go to the Associated Press office in the city where the game was. In that year, it was Kansas City and St. Louis. And, uh, but the following year, I uh, covered the R World Series between the uh, Mets and the Red Sox, and got one of these, which is, which is the Radio Shack TRS-80, it was revolutionary, it was cutting edge, it was amazing. You could actually type your story on this computer, hook it up to a phone line, and send it into the, uh, the home office. It was great. It saved a lot of time and, and effort and running around. And uh, it had 21,000 bytes of memory. So you could get about five stories on here, and then you had to start erasing stuff. And just to compare this to your average smartphone, this has 0.00008% of the memory of a smartphone, but it, it was great back then, I'll tell you. <clears throat> right. And uh, in addition to uh, writing, I actually did the Lowell Spinners radio. The Lowell Spinners are a half-season single A team in Lowell, Mass. And I was the color commentator for that. And it's not that easy because you don't get all this piles and piles of uh, information from the PR department. You know, you have to kind of wing it. And uh, it would not be unusual for a player to come into the game and we didn't know who he was because he just got there that day and the players, they come and they go. And so I'd have to scurry from the radio booth over to the press box and find someone who knew the, who this guy was. But uh, it was a lot of fun doing that. And I actually got to do play-by-play -play a couple of times, uh, which is every boy's dream or every person's dream, really. Uh, the first time, uh, the, the regular play-by-play -play guy was late getting back from a bathroom break, you know, so I, I had to, I, it was to totally caught me by surprise, you know, you have the headphones on and you hear the commercials and then the music comes on, you know that you're going on the air live and I, I, I did it okay. And uh, in addition to that, I, I've been a, a baseball fan ever since I was 10 years old, which is a long time, and uh, I've been to 94 major and minor league ballparks, uh, which is not that easy because my wife uh, doesn't like baseball, so I have to kind of kind of work around that. And I had a, a trip scheduled uh, in June to go to the three. I, there's only three ballparks now in existence that I haven't been to, and I had a trip planned to go to Texas, uh, Miami, and Atlanta, but uh, not adding to my total this year. And uh, nobody's adding to their total this year, actually. And I've got a couple of CDs of baseball songs. Uh, there's Baseball's Greatest Hits, Volume 1, and Baseball's Hits, Volume 2. We're going to raffle off. This is my most recent one. We're going to raffle that off later on. And they're both in the uh, Hall of Fame archive in uh, Cooperstown, New York, which is where they keep music and uh, written material and stuff. So I'm pretty excited about that. I'm going to start off with a song about uh, Johnny Damon. You remember Johnny Damon? 
How could you forget Johnny Damon? He was quite instrumental in the Red Sox winning the World Series in 2004. He was uh, a multi-tool player. He could hit, he could run, he could field, he could hit with power. He couldn't throw worth a damn, but you know, can't have everything. And uh, had a lot of big hits for the Red Sox that postseason. He had a grand slam against the Yankees in the seventh game of the League Championship Series that broke that game open and uh, initiated that amazing comeback from three games down to none. And uh, had some big, big hits in the World Series as well. The following season, 2005, he, he batted 316, his all-time career high. And he became a free agent over the winter. And he did the unthinkable, which was to sign a contract with the uh, New York Yankees for a mere $12 million more. I mean, the nerve of that guy. So I wrote a song about it, and, and people thought it was kind of amusing, you know, back then. And uh, after a few years, it got a little dated, so, so I stopped playing it. But now, now it's, it's retro, it's nostalgic, making a comeback. Why did you go? <laughs> why did you go? Johnny Damon, why did you take the cash and run? Do you think in New York City you'll be having this much fun? They cut your hair and shave your beard and you smile and just say thanks. We don't love you anymore because now you're with the Yanks. Perhaps they didn't tell you, perhaps you did not know. Left center field, 450 plus, that ain't gonna make that throw. There's lots more ground to cover, you're getting slower every year. And I bet by mid-July you wish that you were here. Why did you go, Johnny Damon, why did you take the cash and run? Do you think in New York City you'll be having this much fun? They cut your hair and shave your beard, you smile just say thanks. We don't love you anymore, cause now you're with the Yanks. Now, George, you don't like me, so you best be on your guard. Cause if you don't hit 300, life will never be so hard. And if you don't make the playoffs and win a couple of rounds, the fans will cuss and swear at you, and run you out of town. Why did you go? Johnny Damon, why did you take the cash and run? Do you think in New York City you'll be having this much fun? They cut your hair and shave your beard, you smile, you say thanks. We don't love you anymore, cause now you're with the Yanks. Johnny Damon, why did you take the cash and run? Do you think in New York City you'll be having this much fun? You're out of sight and out of mind, don't think that you'll be missed. We don't need you anymore, cause we got Coco Crisp. Okay, thank you. You're allowed to clap. If you, you're allowed to clap, thank you. All right, we're trying to make this like a like a concert, you know. So, so feel free to take your uh, mute, unmute yourself. Because actually, we're gonna uh, we're gonna do our first trivia question in a minute. But I, I just wanted to mention that uh, Coco Crisp, of course, was the guy who replaced Johnny Damon in center field, and uh, but the Red Sox they had this long range plan. They had a hot shot in the minor leagues named Jacoby Ellsbury. He became the center fielder. Uh, before too long and then so I actually I rewrote the last chorus to reflect that that bit of information and then Ellsbury signed with the Yankees too so I said that ah, heck with it you know so. all right we're gonna do our first trivia question this is my first this is my favorite one because it harkens back to a different era and only two people have gotten it and I've done about 60 of these shows over the past few years and one of them was a ringer he was a sports writer you know so that, 
That, that doesn't count. All right, so what pitcher holds the record for the most strikeouts in one game? I want to take a guess? Excuse me? No, I don't know. You don't know. Anybody want to take a guess? Who are the great strikeout pitchers of, uh, of all time? Okay, well, a lot of people would say uh, Roger Clemens, Kerry oh, yeah. Wood, Max Scherzer, uh, Randy Johnson. And if you answered those, if you came up with those answers, you, you would be wrong. Because <laughs> those guys hold the record for strikeouts in a nine-inning game. Each of them struck out 20 batters in a nine-inning game. As a matter of fact, Clemens, Roger Clemens from the Red Sox, did it twice. Only, only pitcher ever to do it twice. But that's not the right answer, because I didn't say nine-inning game. I said a game. And back in the old days, they used to pitch the whole game. So in 1962, Tom Chaney of the Washington Senators struck out 21 batters in a 16-inning game against the Baltimore Orioles, which he won 2-1. to one. He pitched the entire game, and so he holds the record. And it's interesting because a, a lot of the hallowed baseball records are held by players who are not outstanding all-star players. Uh, Tom Chaney only won 19 games his entire career. He was 19 and 29. But on that particular day, he had, he had it going. Okay, so I'm going to do, uh, so you never probably never heard of Tom Chaney. This is a song about another player you probably never heard of, but this is going to be very educational. You're going to walk away from this show with a lot of knowledge that's fairly useful, useless, but uh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, this is about a ball player named Mike Hessman, and uh, you probably never heard of him. But he has a fascinating story. Uh, he holds the record for the most home runs hit in the minor leagues, which is kind of a dubious record. It's kind of a double-edged sword because uh, he played 20 years of professional baseball, almost all of it in the minor leagues, hit 433 home runs in the, in the minor leagues. But on the other hand, he uh, probably uh, didn't figure that that was the way or di didn't hope that that was the way his career was going to go. But anyway, he... Uh, he was kind of a baseball nomad. He played for 16 different teams over 20 years. Wow. And there were three seasons in which he played for four different teams. So he would, he would get signed, he'd get released, he'd sign again. He, was, he, he had a lot of power. Uh, he struck out a lot and hit for a low average, but he had a lot of power, and that was uh, attractive to a, a lot of people. And uh, so I wrote a song about it. I sent him a copy of the song, and I kind of heard third hand that he liked it because it, it was written up in one of the local papers where he was coaching. And, uh, but I finally caught up with him a couple of years ago. Yeah, in, uh, he, he retired after the 2015 season and became a hitting coach in the minor leagues. And in, in 2018, he was working for the Erie Sea Wolves of the Eastern League. And they had a doubleheader one day up in Portland, Maine. So I, uh, I drove up there and I got to meet him. We took a photo together. And uh, you can see he's a pretty big dude because uh, I'm about 5'10", so he's like 6'5", six, six, or so, and uh, 225 pounds. He's a big, strong guy. And he was very cordial, very friendly. We had a nice chat, and uh, he has no regrets about his baseball career. Uh, he enjoyed every minute of it, and now he's in enjoying coaching. And uh, so I wrote the song about his, uh, his career and his life, and it goes like, it's called The Ballad of Mike Hessman goes like this. If you mention my guest, that name might not ring a bell, but he's a legend in his own right with a grand story to tell. He hit more home runs than any minor leaguer ever did. It took dedication, heart and soul, and a ton of grit. Just kept playing cause he loved it Living out of three Playing baseball for a living Ever since he was 18 Years flew by just like the wind They never lost their thirst Becoming minor league home run king Is a blessing and a curse It started out in Macon Young Mike just had no fear 1997, he hit 21 that year. Danville, Greenville, and Myrtle Beach along the way. 
the homers kept a coming on the road to triple a he just kept playing cause he loved it living out his dream playing baseball for the living ever since he was 18 the years flew by just like the wind he never lost that thirst becoming minor league home run king was blessed He was still in triple A And then 31 and 32 The time just slipped away He played in Mexico And Japan, Venezuela too 16 teams in 20 years Then finally he was through Thank you. That is the story of Mike Hespin, the minor league home run king. All right, I'm going to get unraveled here, get untangled, and tell you a little bit about a project that I did in 1985, which is 35 years ago. I don't need the guitar for this, so. Gonna. So I, I did a, a nationwide campaign to get rid of the designated hitter rule. Now, I know that sounds like heresy here in Boston because David Ortiz was a designated hitter and you know he helped them win three World Series and was very popular and a, and a great player. But I just never liked it. But before we get going here, I want to just see, and those of you who just entered the room, if you can put on your video and unmute yourself, that would kind of make this more like a, a community concert. But if you're not comfortable, that's fine. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Um, okay, so I, wanted, I just want to get an idea of how many of you guys like the designated hitter rule? And how many of you guys don't like it? And how many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> All right, well, I'll explain what it is. So the designated hitter rule, or the DH rule, was instituted by the American League in 1973. And prior to that, the, the years running up to 1973, uh, offense in baseball was, uh, was, was spiraling downward kind of at an alarming rate. Uh, less hits, less home runs, less runs, and, and the owners were, were getting increasingly fearful. <clears throat> so what they did was they, they tried this rule out on an experimental basis and ev eventually adopted it full time, whereby the pitcher didn't have to bat because pitchers typically are not great hitters. <clears throat> So the pitcher wouldn't bat, and there would be someone in the lineup called the designated hitter who would, who would bat in, instead of the pitcher. So essentially, you had two players sharing one position. You had uh, the pitcher who would pitch but not be in the lineup, and then the designated hitter who would not play the field who would just hit. So I never liked it. it, it just I'm, I guess I'm an old-timer. I'm a traditionalist, a purist, you know, but it changes a lot of the fundamental strategies and nuances of the game. For instance, if, if you want to make a pitching change and you're managing with it without the DH, you have to see, well, where's the pitcher coming up in the lineup? Will I have to pinch hit for him down the line? If I do, who am I going to pinch, use to pinch hit? Who am I going to bring in next? But with the DH, you don't have to do that. And if you have a player who's a great hitter but doesn't really have a position, then you have to figure out there's another strategy. You have to figure out, well, where am I going to play this guy where he's going to hurt me the least? So those are couple of things that, that go out the window when you have the DH. And I actually like watching the pitchers hit because 
even though they don't do well most of the time, when they do something amazing, it's just an unexpected source of excitement. And uh, for instance, I, uh, I went to a game between the Mets and the Cubs where Rick Sutcliffe, pitching for the Cubs, got two hits in one inning. That's pretty amazing. And uh, I don't know if you remember back to the 70s, but Rick Wise was a guy who pitched, used to pitch for the Red Sox. Uh, he accomplished this feat while he was with the Phillies. He probably had the most amazing game of any player in Major League history. Rick Wise pitched a no in 1971. He pitched a no-hitter and hit two home runs in the same game. I mean, that, that's just phenomenal. And uh, <clears throat> Jim Tobin who was a pitcher for the Boston Braves, hit three home runs in one game, only pitcher ever to do that. And uh, Tony Cloninger, pitching for the Braves, hit two grand slams in one game and an RBI single. He had nine RBIs. Those are still, the two grand slams and the nine RBIs are still the records, team records for the Braves. And he was the first National League player to do that, to hit two grand slams in a game. It's only been done, I think, 13 times in Major League history. And Earl Wilson, if you remember back uh, the Red Sox in the 60s, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> hit 35 career home runs. Uh, he played for the Red Sox and the, and the Tigers and a bunch of other teams. 35 career home runs, and two of them as a pinch hitter because he was a big, strong guy, and when he got hold of one, he could send it a long way. And finally, consider this. Babe Ruth, Bill Terry, George Sisler, Ted Williams, and Stan Musial all began their careers as pitchers. So if they had the designated hitter rule back in the early 1900s, Babe Ruth would have never become a hitter. He never would have hit 714 home runs, saved baseball, and the entire evolution of the universe would have been changed, and I probably wouldn't be standing here today. So, anyway, fast forward to like 1985, Peter Ubroth, the commissioner of baseball, decided, well, I'm going to take a poll of all the baseball fans and see if we want to keep the designated hitter rule or get rid of it. So I decided I'm going to do this national campaign. I was a lot younger, I didn't have kids then, and you know, I had a lot more energy. So if you want to do a national campaign, you got to come up with a catchy slogan. So this was my slogan here, dump the DH. And I printed up a couple of thousand bumper stickers and uh, I, I, I uh, made up a brochure of some of the facts that I just talked about and, and some other things. And I sent it all over radio and TV and newspapers and magazines. And it was the 1985 version of going viral. I mean, it was amazing. It was written up in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Herald, it was on TBS, National Cable, and I did 30 radio shows, including one night I did three hours in uh, San Francisco. People just wanted to talk about this. They were very passionate about it. And I also got a story to run in Sports Illustrated. They actually came out to my house and took a photo and <clears throat> interviewed me. And when that, <clears throat> that ran in Sports Illustrated, it went out to about four million people. And from that point forward, I started getting mail from all over the world. People were, because I was selling the Dump the DH bumper sticker and a brochure for a couple of bucks. So I started getting, people were sending me cash from New Zealand and Mexico and Europe. It was, it was pretty amazing. So you're probably wondering, well, what happened with the poll? How did that, how did that turn out? Well, the poll never, was, never took place. And I actually know that. I did some research on it, but I actually got to talk to Peter Uberoff because he was a guest on Larry King's show, and I was able to call in and find out. So, and he, I asked him directly, and he hemmed and hawed and really didn't give us uh, any information. So you're probably thinking, well, you know, the whole, the whole campaign, all that, all that money and all that, all that effort went for naught, but I had a lot of fun with it, and uh, I got into the Hall of Fame because uh, my bumper sticker is now in the Hall of Fame Museum. Can we get that up there? Yeah. Uh, in, it, in, the, in the main museum, it's got my name underneath it. So uh, pretty cool. So had a lot of fun, got into the Hall of Fame. Can't really complain about that. All right, we're going to do another trivia question. But before we do that, I want to uh, tell you about the, uh, the, the CD raffle. So we're going to raffle off a, uh, one of my baseball CDs for free. Uh, we're going to do this virtually, and if you win, you'll get a digital copy of the album emailed to you. So, wh what you have to do is go into the chat room, 
you know what the chat room is? It's probably at the bottom center of your screen. And put your name and a number between 0 and 100. And I gave uh, Brandon a number before the... You remember what it is, Brandon? He's yep, muted. got it. You got it. Okay, so put a number between 0 and 100 next, next to your name, and then the person closest to it uh, will, will receive a copy of the CD. And if you want to buy the CD, you can go on my website and uh, do that as well. But, all right, so here's the trivia question. Got to tune up first, though. Um, the Red Sox pulled off a big blockbuster trade in 2004. They traded Nomar Garcia Parra to the uh, Chicago Cubs. So, w which two players did they receive in return? If I remember, I know it was a while ago, but I'll give you a couple more seconds. <clears throat> Okay, well, it was a very complicated trade. It involved four teams. It involved the Red Sox, the Montreal Expos, the Cubs, and the Minnesota Twins. And they received Orlando Cabrera from the Montreal Expos, who uh, became, their, uh, became their shortstop and did very well, helped them win the World Series. And also Doug Minkiewicz from the Minnesota Twins. And uh, Doug Minkiewicz actually recorded the final out of the 2004 World Series. There he is, jumping up in the air, and Keith Folk. If you remember, it was a ground ball back to Folk, and he flipped it over to Minkiewicz. So uh, I wrote a song about Doug Minkiewicz, but that's not why I wrote the song. I wrote the song because until he came to the Red Sox, I could never pronounce his name, you know? It, it's one of these long names, and they had to take the vowels out to squeeze it into the box score. So, uh, but when he, once he came over here, and it's on radio, it's on TV, it's in the newspaper. Um, I learned how to say it, and I, I found this name to be a very poetic name. It had sort of a poetic cadence to it. Kind of fun to say. Doug Minkiewicz, you know? And I figured if it was, if it was that much fun to say, it must be three, four, five times as much fun to sing. So that's why I wrote the song. Doug Minkiewicz, he's my favorite player. Doug Minkiewicz, he's the man, he's the man. Doug Minkiewicz, I just love to say it. Doug Minkiewicz, he's the man, he's the man. When he was a twin, it didn't mean a thing. Then he joined the Sox. Doug Minkiewicz really rocked. Doug Minkiewicz, he's my favorite player. Doug Minkiewicz, he's the man, he's the man. He's kind to his mother and a former gold glover. Doug may not make the Hall of Fame, but he's got 12 letters in his name. Doug Minkiewicz, I can't even spell it. Doug Minkiewicz, but I sure do like to yell it. Doug Minkiewicz, he's my favorite player. Doug Minkiewicz, he's the man, he's the man. M-I-E-N-D-K-I-E-W-I-C-Z. -E -E I think that's right. Doug Minkiewicz, he's my favorite player. Doug Minkiewicz, he just took that ball and ran. Doug Minkiewicz, I just love to say it. Doug Minkiewicz, he's the man. He's the man, he's the man, Doug Minkiewicz, he's the man. Alrighty, thank you very much. Thank you. That's actually not too much, didn't learn too much about him uh, in that song, but that's okay. Learned how to spell it. Okay, so I, t I told you about the Dump the DH campaign. <clears throat> Well, that was 1985. I, I did that, and I decided the next year I was going to do another campaign because now I know how to do this stuff, so it's going to be even bigger and better. So I decided in 1986 to do a national campaign to get rid of artificial turf because it was very prevalent in the 80s. 
And, uh, you know, I don't think anybody really liked it. I mean, it, the ball shot through the infield like it was coming out of a cannon. It took weird bounces in the outfield. It was hard on the players' legs, and it was ugly looking, too. So, as I said, you got to come up with that catchy slogan. So, here it is. Pull out the rug. Printed up a couple thousand of these things and uh, put together this brochure. I did a lot of research on this. I talked to agronomists and turf experts and, uh, and scientists. And, uh, you know, it got, some, it got written up in USA Today and in a few other papers. But for some reason, it did not have nearly the effect of the uh, Dump the DH campaign. So I don't know why. But uh, so anyway, I've got like a couple of hundred of these bumper stickers left over so if you <laughs> want one let me know I'm, i'll figure out a way to get it to you but uh perhaps you're wondering how artificial turf came into existence i mean did somebody just wake up one day and say well plastic grass has got to be better than real grass maybe you're wondering it or maybe you don't really care but you're going to hear about it anyway so i'm going to tell it to you so the way artificial turf came into existence was in 1962, the uh, National League expanded, added two new teams, the New York Mets and the Houston Colt 45s. Uh, they had to change their name to the Astros because of a, a, a trademark infringement. And uh, you, anybody been to Houston? Any of you guys ever been to Houston? What's it like in Houston? Hot. It's hot. It, I, I think you're, you're muted, so you need to unmute yourself there. But I assume you said it was hot. Urban sprawl. Yeah. It, it's, a bi it's big sprawling, but it's really hot. It's uncomfortable. So, so they, they played all their games at night. They played Saturday night, Sunday night, holiday nights. It was actually unthinkable back in the 60s to play a game on a Sunday night, but they, but they did. But they had a long-range plan in mind, and they were going to build this new stadium. It had a dome on it. They were going to air condition the stadium. It was going to be great. No rainouts, comfortable temperatures, low humidity. And so in, in 1965, they opened the Houston Astrodome, and it was heralded as the eighth wonder of the world. And uh, there it is. Uh, they did have some problems with it initially, though. As you can see, the, the uh, the roof is made of these uh, translucent panels, and the original version of that created a background that was very difficult for fielders to track the ball. So infield, infield pop-ups were dropping all over the place. Uh, routine fly balls were turning into doubles and triples, and so they had to figure out, they couldn't play a whole a season like that, so they had to figure out something. So they actually, they painted the panels to provide a better background, and that solved the problem. The fielders had no problem seeing the ball. The only problem was no sunlight came in and all the grass died. So by the end of the year, they had these big blotches of brown all over the field. It was ugly. They were spray painting it green. They were throwing dirt out there and they were painting that. And uh, they, they figured they had to come up with a solution to this for the next season. So over the winter, over the winter they, pon they uh, partnered with Monsanto and... Uh, came up with artificial turf. So that's how artificial turf came into existence. And uh, there are four fields. Here's an, another trivia question. There are four fields in Major League Baseball that still have uh, the artificial turf. Can anybody name uh, any of those four? No, Bob. What was that? I'm sorry. I, I have to be like six feet away from the computer, so it's hard for me to hear it sometimes. What was your guess? Toronto is one, uh, Rogers Center in Toronto. And then uh, Tropicana Field in, uh, in Tampa, where the Tampa Bay Rays play. That was uh, another one. And actually, I went to that ballpark several years ago, and it's generally considered to be the worst ballpark in Major League history. But I had such low expectations that I actually enjoyed it. Uh, the other two are in the uh, National League. No, actually, one more in the American League, which is the new Texas Stadium, where the Rangers are playing. That has artificial turf. And then Chase Field in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, originally had uh, natural turf, and it had a, a retractable dome, so you could get the sunlight in. But it's very hot in, in Arizona as well, and they used so much water to maintain that field. They thought it was environmentally irresponsible to keep the grass, so they, they switched it out, I believe, was last year. So anyway... 
About seven or eight years prior to this campaign, I, I had written a uh, song about artificial turf because it was the 70s and all the folk singers, you know, they were writing, uh, they were writing protest songs. So this, this was my protest song. And I actually incorporated the, uh, I incorporated this song into the campaign. And actually, you know, it, it may have had a latent effect, even though it wasn't over, over, overly successful. Because, uh, like I said, only four fields have artificial turf now, so. But here's, here it is. Now we got artificial flavors and artificial snow. Imitation mayonnaise, false teeth, and you know you got artificial colors in your food and for your hair. But that artificial grass is just too much for me to bear. If Abner Doubleday was alive, he'd be gassed. If he went to a baseball game and didn't see no grass, just a big green carpet with some fancy white lines, a little bit of dirt, and those metric signs he'd see AstroTurf. AstroTurf, what have they done to old Mother Earth? I don't want nothing eat my feet that a horse can't eat, so take it away. It all began in Houston where they play the game indoors. They built the big dome stadium, but one of its flaws was the grass just wouldn't grow where the sun refused to shine. So they ripped it out and put in the artificial kind. They put in AstroTurf, AstroTurf. What have they done to old Mother Earth? I don't want nothing to eat my feet that a horse can't eat. So take it away. Okay, thank you. All righty, that's, that's more than you need to know about artificial turf, but uh, you got it. We're going to do another, another trivia question. This is a fairly simple one, so unmute yourself, otherwise I won't, uh, won't be able to hear your answers. But uh, how many 200 hit seasons did Ted Williams have? I want to take a guess. He played 19 years, so it's between zero and 19, I guess. They want to take a stab? Ten. Ten? That's way off. But uh, four. You, four is closer. You would think that Ted Williams, who was one of the greatest hitters of all time, would have had a lot of 200 hit seasons. But the, actually, the correct answer is zero. He never had 200 hits in a season. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of reasons for that. First of all, he played in the era of the 154 game schedule. So that was eight less games that he had. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, his philosophy of hitting was that the, the he had a very, very uh, disciplined strategy to hitting, and you, he, he did not swing at a ball that was outside the strike zone. So he drew more walks than all but two players in Major League history. He was third on the, third on the all-time list, and he probably would have been first had he not been in the military for five years. So he drew a lot of walks. So he, you know, th those were potential times when he could have gotten a hit. So. Uh, he had 190 hits or more twice, and even the year that he batted 406, which he was the last player to bat 400 in 1941, he only had 185 hits, but he had 147 walks. And his uh, on-base percentage of, uh, was 482 for his career, which means that about every other time he came to the plate, he, he reached base on a hit or a walk, which is pretty unbelievable, really. So uh, that's... Uh, Another little kind of tricky trivia question. Um, I also should point out that um, I mo the baseball songs are about 10% of the songs that I've written. So I've written uh, a lot of other kind of quirky, funny, and some serious songs too. So if you go to my website, uh, you can check that out. But a lot of people get the wrong impression that all I do is baseball songs, but not true. But I, I, do, uh, do, so I do songs about everyday life, and for me, 
part of my everyday life is, is following baseball, so I, I've done that. Anyway, this is, this is a song about a, a sort of a semi-tragic event that happened in 1978 to the Red Sox. Uh, does anybody remember what happened to the Red Sox in 1978? Okay, well, I will tell you. So the Red Sox had a 14-game lead on the Yankees for the division, to win the Eastern Division, and they squandered it away and wound up tied at the end of the regular season. And they had to uh, do a one-game tiebreaker with the Yankees, and they were, they were looking pretty good in that one game. So the winner went to the playoffs, and they were ahead 2 to nothing in the seventh inning, and Mike Therese was throwing a shutout. And uh, then Bucky Dent came up and uh, hit, a, hit a home run. I think we have a picture of Bucky, don't we? Yeah, there he is. He had a three-run home run into the, into the net in left field, and that put the Yankees ahead to stay, and they won the game. They won the division. No wild card back then, so the Red Sox won 99 games and uh, went home. And actually, if you could see in the background, you could see actual people sitting in the seats at Fenway Park, which is kind of a... Interesting thing. There you go. See, there are actual people there. No, no cutouts. So anyway, I wrote a song about that that season, and it was also inspired by my mother, who was a, a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. And you know, the Dodgers had great teams in the 40s and 50s, but they could never beat the Yankees in the World Series. Although they did one time, uh, 1955. But every other time they lost. So the battle cry out of Brooklyn every year was "Wait until next year," and uh, that's the title of this song. This was the best damn team that I ever did see. It had strength up the middle, it had power and speed. Most of the season they could do no wrong. But when October rolled around, it was the same old song. Wait until next year. Wait until next year. Exactly what went wrong. Is all too clear So near and so far Close but no cigar It's a long, long way Till opening day And the winter's getting near Have another beer Wait till next year We all thought it was a piece of cake that 12 game lead at the All Star break, but the pitching was lousy, the hitting got worse, and the next thing I knew we were out of first. Wait until next year. Wait until next year. It's a long, long wait till opening day, and the winter getting near. Outs of the summer became the outs of the fall That baseball team made fools of us all Squandered that lead and it didn't take long And October arrived with the same old song Wait until next year Wait till next year Exactly what went wrong is all too clear So near and so far Close but no cigar It's a long, long way till opening day And the winter's getting near Have another beer, wait till next year Have another beer, wait till next year Okay, thank you very much. That's one of the things that I love about baseball is that it uh, has like the best jargon, the best expressions, the best nicknames. So this next song is a bit of baseball jargon. It's called uh, Mendoza Line, and it's on my Baseball's Greatest Hits, Volume 2 CD. 
Anybody know what the Mendoza line is? Nope. Okay. Well, see, this is going to be very informative as, as well as entertaining. So the Mendoza line stands for a 200 batting average, and so you're either above it or below it. And uh, Like J.D. Martinez has been flirting with it the last month or so. And I was inspired by Mario Mendoza, who is the prototypical slick fielding, weak hitting shortstop. He managed to stay in the major leagues for nine seasons based solely on his uh, defensive ability. There he is. He played for three teams. He played for the Pirates, as shown there, played for the Mariners, and he played for the Texas Rangers. And he stayed in the major leagues for nine seasons. And he became infamous one day when uh, George Brett, I'm sure you've heard of George Brett, Hall of Famer, third baseman, uh, he had started this season in a terrible slump, and he was, he was talking to reporters one afternoon, and he said something to the effect of, I knew I was off to a slow start when I looked at the averages and saw that I was below the Mendoza line. So from that point forward, Mario Mendoza became this sort of tragic icon, always associated with a 200 batting average. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to write a song about it, so you know, I went on the internet, did a little research, came up with this song, and... Uh, when it was finished, I liked it enough to go and record it. So before you record a song, you got to figure out, well, what kind of song is this going to be? You know, like what musical genre? You can't just be like Bruce Springsteen and go into the studio and start experimenting with all these different arrangements. So to my ear, Mendoza line sounds like something from the wild, wild west. So we did like a country and western version, put together this great... <laughs> great country band in the studio and recorded it. It came out really well. And I was thinking, you know, it'd be really fun to have the guys from the band come in and, and, uh, and sing it with me and, and play it with me. But that's, of course, not practical. So I've got the next best thing for you, which is the karaoke version of the song. It'll sound just like the band is here. And uh, so I'd like to do that for you right now. And there's a little uh, uh, sing-along part in it for you. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, you can't do sing-alongs on, uh, on Zoom because there's a two-second delay, but we do it anyway. <coughs> so I need a couple of seconds here to crank this up. I'm mired in this awful slump I need some luck to clear the hump Or I'll be riding buses any day I need a hit so bad that I could cry The worse I do, the harder I try That 90 feet looks like a mile away I'll take a bloop, a flare, a 16 hopper A lucky bouncer, a Baltimore chopper Just get me across that old man knows a lie of course, I'd prefer a frozen rope, but a swinging bunt would give me hope. I gotta cross that old Mendoza line. Here's the sing along Mendoza line, Mendoza line. Just get me across that old Mendoza line. Mendoza line, Mendoza line. Gotta cross that old Mendoza line. Now Mario Mendoza, for whom this line is named, was an actual big leaguer for 686 games. He played short and second, a little third at quite a club, so I've heard, which was essential because he barely hit his way. Though known for his infield utility, he set the benchmark for futility, flirting with 200 all the time. Now in 79, tied an all-time mark for the most games played in a big league park with an average below the Mendoza line. I'll take a bleep, a flare, a 16 hopper, a lucky bouncer, a Baltimore chopper, just get me across that old Mendoza line. Of course, I'd prefer a frozen rope, but a swinging bunt give me hope. I got across that old Mendoza line. Let me hear you now. Mendoza line. Just get me across that old Mendoza line. Mendoza line. Mendoza line. 
got to cross that old Mendoza line. And this is the only song where I can take a drink in the middle, so I'm going for it. Made the playoffs only once, and here's his stats. Three games played and one hit in five total at-bats. I'll do the math correctly, you will surely find. It's right smack dab on that end of the line. So if you're struggling on the field or any part of life, think of that brave soul from south of the border. He plugged and scrapped his whole life through only to be linked to an aptitude. Is it true or mortal? Of a different order. I'll take a blue a flare, a sixteen hopper, a lucky bounce, or a Baltimore chopper. Just get me across that old Mendoza line. Of course, I'd prefer a frozen rope, but a swinging bunt. Give me hope. I got across that old Mendoza line last time. Mendoza line. Mendoza line. Get me cross that old Mendoza line. Gotta cross that old Mendoza line. Just get me cross that old Mendoza line. Get me cross that old Mendoza line. Thank you very much. Uh, let me introduce the members of the band. Uh, directly behind me on the drums is Chris Anzalone. Play along, please. Thank you. Thank you. Oop, applause for you. On my left here on bass, Rob Ignazio. To my right on electric guitar and mandolin, Steve Mayone. And on backup vocals, actually, uh, I did all the backup vocals. And there's a reason for that, you know? Thank you very much. Thank you. There's a reason for that because, you know, you go into a studio and you hire professional singers, it gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. So I did all the vocals myself and I only charged myself half as much. So I, I saved quite a bit of money doing that. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself right now, this is just some cheap publicity stunt to promote the CD. Well, let me tell you something. You're right. You got me. So it's uh, called Baseball's Greatest Hits, Volume 2. And uh, you can order it off my website, or you can order it off iTunes, uh, or uh, CD Baby, or Amazon, or any of those places. All right. All right. Uh, you know, a lot of people are, think that uh, baseball is no longer the national pastime, although I, I tend to disagree. I do realize that football gets higher ratings, but I think more people follow baseball, read about it, listen to it on the radio, understand it, care about it, have played baseball or softball at some point in their lives. So I think baseball is still number one in our hearts. But uh, many years ago, uh, the late great comedian George Carlin did a terrific comedy bit uh, that was comparing baseball to football. And I'd like to share that with you right now. Whoops, wrong seat. Okay, baseball is a 19th century pastoral game. Football is a 20th century technological struggle. Baseball's played in a diamond, in a park, the baseball park. Football's played on a gridiron, in a stadium, sometimes called Soldier Field or War Memorial Stadium. Football, you wear a helmet. Baseball, you wear a cap. Football is concerned with downs. What down is it? Baseball is concerned with ups. Who's up? Football has clipping, spearing, piling on, personal fouls, late hitting, and unnecessary roughness. Baseball has the sacrifice. In football, you receive a penalty. In baseball, you make an error. Football is played in any kind of weather. Rain, snow, sleet. Hail, fog, but in baseball, if it rains, we do not go out to play. Baseball has the seventh inning stretch. Football has the two-minute warning. 
Baseball has no time limit. We don't know when it's going to end. We might go extra innings. Football is rigidly timed and will end even if we have to go to sudden death. And finally, the objectives of the two games are completely different. In football, the object is for the quarterback, also known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy in spite of the blitz, even if he has to use the shotgun. With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory, balancing this aerial assault with a sustained ground attack that punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line. In baseball, the object is to go home and be safe. Okay, we're going to finish up with a couple of songs that you know. Uh, well, let's do the, uh, Brandon, can we do the, uh, the raffle for the CD? Do you have a name of a person who uh, won? Yep, the, the one who was the closest was Susan Burnett Halling with 52, very close. All right. <laughs> All right, so uh, the way you, so send Susan my, my web address, and then if you go to my website, you'll get my email. Send me an email because I have to email you the tracks, and I will email you the uh, song tracks and the album art. And uh, for those of you who didn't win, you could still go to my website, and uh, you can go to the chat room. Uh, uh, Brandon will put it up, and it's very easy. It's HowieNewman.com. It's H-O-W-I-E-N-E-W-M-A-N.com. And I have uh, a couple of baseball CDs and a lot of other stuff too. So. I so just sent you a private that, message, Susan. Excuse me? Just telling me, uh, Susan I sent her a private message with the link and everything. Okay. Um, this is a song that, it's not really a baseball song, but they play it at Fenway Park every single game. I wonder if they still do it. I don't know, because <laughs> there's nobody in the stands. But uh, it was Neil Diamond's song. I played in the middle of the eighth inning. and. Uh, the way this happened was about 15 years ago, a uh, Red Sox employee and his wife had a baby girl named Caroline. And so they played Sweet Caroline over the, over the PA system in, in the eighth inning. And everybody sang along and had a great time with it. And so they tried it the next night and the same thing happened. And so they've been doing it ever since. So feel free to uh, sing along. You can do this kind of stuff too and, and whatever and, and get involved. up everybody hands up warm they go touching warm reaching out touching me touching you sweet Caroline good time that never seems so good Believe they never would, but now I look at the night and it don't seem so lonely. We fill it up with only two. And when I heard hurt runs off my shoulder, how can I hurt when holding? Hands up one more time. Warm, touching warm, reaching out, touching me, touching you, sweet Caroline. Good times that never seem so good. I, I, 
fine And to believe they never would Sweet Caroline Good times that never seem so good I've been in time To believe they never would Okay, thank you. All right, I've got one more song, but before I go, and actually, when I finish, we usually do like a little, maybe three to five minute chit chat with the audience and, you know, talk to people and uh, rather than just abruptly ending the show, it's kind of, so if you want to stick around afterwards and, and just say hello and we could talk a little baseball or whatever, that'd be fine. Or if you had got to go somewhere, that, that's fine too. But I want to thank all you people for showing up uh, this morning. I appreciate it. Uh, thank the Beverly Public Library and Ona and all the people over there. Give them a nice round of applause. They're working very hard to find things, programs that are entertaining and informative and educational, and it's not that easy to do in the middle of a pandemic. So, uh, you know, they, they deserve a lot of credit. And uh, check the website of the Public Library, and, and they'll check the calendar there, and they have lots of interesting things to do for people of different ages, different times during the day, and it's really great. I also want to thank Brandon. Uh, he's, uh, he's been my tech for almost all my baseball shows and my other shows, and uh, he does a great job with the photos and making sure everything sounds good and nobody enters the room that's not supposed to be here, you know, so that's cool. So thanks, thanks Brandon, I appreciate it. This is, I think, my 15th baseball show that I've done, and uh, he's been there for most of them. So uh, I'm going to do one final song here, which I think you know, so you I want you to unmute yourselves and sing along. This song was written in 1908 by Albert von Tinsler and Jack Norworth. There they are. Neither of whom had ever been to a baseball game Neither prior to writing this song. And uh, they didn't go to a game for like another 20 years. So uh, Apparently, they weren't terribly convinced about their subject matter, but that's neither here nor there. So just join in. Here we go. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jack. I don't care if I ever get back in as a room. Root, root for the Red Sox If they don't get some pitching for next year It'll be a shame And it's one, two, three strikes You're out at the old ball game All right, we're going to do it one more time A little more enthusiasm, okay? I mean, I know the Red Sox are horrible this year But still fun to watch Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jack. I don't care if I never get back. And it's root, root, root for the Red Sox. If they don't win, it's a shame. Big finish now. Here we go. For it. Three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Okay. All right, give me like about 30 seconds to uh, get into a place where I can sit down. All righty, so un unmute yourselves, everybody. We have a little discussion. Um, You've been following the base. Anybody been following the Red Sox, or you g g gave up on them a while ago? I think it's a. Li it's kind of. It's some of the stories are in are interesting. I think uh, you got Bobby Dalbach hit a lot of home runs, and Tanner Houck pitched uh, yesterday, right? And uh, he's he's got two good starts. So rather than just wins or losses, there are some interesting things going on, but. 
I guess once the Patriots started, uh, you know, and they have have the, the basketball playoffs and the hockey. But how did you guys find out about the show? Was it through the library? Through yeah. the library. Through the library. They they did a good job in uh, promoting yeah. that, so that, that's great. And uh, cool. Have you done a lot of Zoom shows or is this yes. first? And and uh, so you like it. You, yeah. You've got you've got the technology down and everything. Yep. Takes <laughs> takes takes no. <laughs> It is different, I'll tell you. It really is different, but uh, it, it's uh, it's the best we ha it's the best and safest thing we can do right now. And uh, there are a lot of advantages to it, you know. It's like, uh, you know, I, I uh, set the stuff up in my living room, you know, and <laughs> I don't have to go traveling anywhere. But uh, especially for a 9:30 gig, I probably would have had to get up a lot earlier. And uh, like the idea of being able to mute people because like I used to play in a lot of bars and stuff where people are pretty noisy so it would, would have been helpful back then but uh, so did anybody watch the Patriots last night you stay up to the very end yeah you got to stay up till the end it almost went down to the la literally went down to the last few seconds I was kind of a wimp I I watched the first three quarters and then I watched I DVR'd it and I, I watched uh, the fourth quarter this morning while I was having breakfast but uh, well, I was glad to see you. Anybody have any questions or anything? Or uh, you, you could have a question of Ona about the library, or, or any baseball questions, or any Zoom questions, or anything like that. All righty. Well, thanks for coming. I want to thank you very much for inviting me. It's, oh, it was fun. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. This went very smoothly. Oh, good. Yes. Well, yeah, we've I was done happy to have you. Yeah. yeah we, uh, we had fun. We enjoy it. And uh, so. Uh, Susan, you'll you'll get uh, send me an email. I'll I'll get you your. Uh, yeah, I, I'm having trouble connecting to your link, but I'll get it through the website. If you just yeah, or uh, you can shoot you, me an email. I shoot can, an email. You can just Google yeah. my name, Howie Newman, H O W E N E W M, and you'll you'll find it. What? And uh, <laughs> great. I'll pass okay, it well, on thanks. Have a good day. Time. Enjoy uh, enjoy the good weather while we have it, and stay safe. And, yeah, uh, we'll see and I hope to see all of you next week and the week after and. Right. Someday in the, person. <laughs> check out the calendar. They got some great stuff going on at the yeah. library. So take care now. Okay. Have a good day. Bye.